Guess what we're talking about today? You and me, baby. We're talking about the it factor. Some people just have it, don't they? And based on the research, when people have the it factor, it means they have charisma. So today, you're going to meet one of the world's leading researchers and experts on charisma and body language, Vanessa Van Edwards. And she's here to prove to you that you have the it factor. Yes, I'm talking to you. And the skill of charisma, that is how you are going to bring your it factor to life. Let's go, man. Class is in session. Hey, it's your friend Mel. And welcome to an amazing Buckle Up Your Seatbelt episode of the Mel Robbins Podcast. Guess what we're talking about today? You and me, baby. We're talking about the it factor. That's right, the it factor. I don't even know how to say it, but we're talking about it. Some people just have it, don't they? Just think about who you admire that has the it factor. I'll give you my list. Oprah, The Rock, The Dalai Lama, Taylor Swift. Oh, and the late Robin Williams and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Those folks, they have the it factor. Why? Well, because they have this ability to make me lean in and care about what they're saying. We not only admire folks like this, but we like them and we trust them. That is the heart of having the it factor. And based on the research, when people have the it factor, you know what it means? It means they have charisma. Charisma is a really cool thing because charisma will make you more influential. It'll help you make a bigger impact. And charisma absolutely is going to help you make some more money because according to the research, 82% of people's impression of you is based on whether or not you display charisma. Did you hear that? 82% of someone's impression of you based on whether or not you got charisma. I know I said it twice. That's how important it is. And here's the coolest thing about charisma. It's really easy to hack when you know the simple things you need to do. So today, here's what we're doing on the show. You're going to meet one of the world's leading researchers and experts on charisma and body language, Vanessa Van Edwards. She's a behavioral investigator, the founder of the research group Science of People, the author of the best-selling books on these topics, Captivate and Cues, and she's here to prove to you that you have the it factor. Yes, I'm talking to you. And the skill of charisma, that is how you are going to bring your it factor to life so you can make an impact, you can influence people, and you can make more income. Let's go, man. Class is in session. I am so excited for this. So let's dial up the skill of charisma. Let's bring the it factor to life. Let's increase our influence, impact, and income, people. And let's welcome Vanessa to the Mel Robbins podcast. I'm so excited for this. Vanessa, I'm so glad you're here. Well, welcome. I'm so psyched you're here. I'm so happy to be here. I can't even tell you. Well, let's just jump right into it because you have written the book on both charisma and body language. And so I want to start with what is charisma and why does it matter? What people don't realize is that charisma, more than any other attribute, is the single most important aspect of you being successful. It helps you in your relationships. It helps you professionally. It helps people take you seriously. It helps you also feel more confident and purposeful in your interactions. So charisma is that missing ingredient that we need to trigger or activate our success. Wow. I mean, you hear so much about confidence. You hear about extroverts versus introverts. But how is it that charisma impacts all those things more than your personality or confidence. When research looks at highly charismatic people, they find that we are looking for people who are signaling high charisma because it shows all those other things. Highly charismatic people are confident. They are competent. They are warm. They are likable. And so the most amazing aspect of charisma is it can be learned. It is not an innate trait. You don't have to be born with it or not, that anyone can be, can learn how to be more charismatic through a very specific set of cues. That's crazy. And you, you say that you were very awkward before you leveraged all the cues you're about to teach us. Will you tell us a little bit about what you struggled with? So what's funny about charisma, I've always been fascinated by this trait. I'm a recovering awkward person. <laughs> charisma does not come naturally to me. I've always been fascinated by the cool kids. You know, I watch them and I'm like, oh, how do they know what to do? And so I was for many years trapped by this mistaken belief 
that to be charismatic, you have to be extroverted. You have to be bubbly. You have to be the life of the party. And I am not an extrovert. And so I always thought, well, I guess I can't have it. It's an innate trait. You have to be extroverted. But what research actually finds is that charisma has nothing to do with your extroversion, your attractiveness, your athleticism, even your intelligence. The actual definition of highly charismatic people, what makes them different is they set, send a very specific set of social signals. Specifically, they are constantly signaling high warmth, so trust, likability, friendliness, along with, and this is the key, a balance of high competence, capability, power, effectiveness. And what's magical about this is if you're with someone and you are drawn into them, you immediately are able to answer two questions. I can trust you and I can rely on you. And so highly charismatic people, that's what they're signaling, warmth and competence at all times. Wow. Okay. So let me see if I just can bottom line this. Yes. So charisma, if you have charisma or you display charisma, I guess is what I should say. Yes. If you display charisma, other people are left with the impression that they can trust you and that they can count on you. Is that yes. right? That is exactly right. And the funny, the hard part about this is you can be the warmest, most competent person in the world. But if you don't show those signals, the world does not believe you. And this comes from amazing research out of Princeton University, which found that under signaling, so not signaling enough, and this is what happens, I think, with very smart people. So most of my students are high, off the charts, intelligence, high achievers, and they think, oh, my smarts will speak for me, right? I, I'm really smart. I can make it through anything. I'm super prepared. I have great answers. And the problem is they under signal the warmth and competence cues. And what Dr. Fisk found, the creator of this research, she found that without enough warmth, people do not believe your competence. So the problem of smart people is they think their smarts work for them, but if they're not using the right signals, the world literally cannot believe them. Wow. That's so, so is this why charisma matters? So I think of charisma like a lubricant, right? So when we're in social That's sexy. <laughs> a social that is lubricant. not exactly the word I was I, that I thought that or the metaphor I thought you were going to use. Okay, so charisma it, it is a social smooth. lubricant. Everybody, yeah, okay, it's it smooth. You know, it makes it smooth because listen, my interactions, my social interactions before I learned this science were like the opposite of smooth. They were crunchy, like not in a good way, right? Okay, like, so you said you were awkward. Give us an example. I, Come on, I'm Vanessa. A recover, I'm a recovering awkward person. So. Awkwardness. Let's talk about awkwardness is one of my favorite topics. Awkwardness dresses up in different ways. So my awkwardness, and everyone has a different things. So I'm curious, Mel, if you have any awkwardness, how it dresses up. Some people, they feel awkward because of fear. Their fear of being rejected, fear of being criticized, fear of saying something silly or sounding stupid. And so their awkwardness will dress up as shutting down. So for me, my awkwardness, I'm an overthinker. I'm the person who I get in bed at the end of the night and I literally rethink every conversation I've had the whole day. <laughs> right. Or like I, I overanalyze my answers before I even say anything, which makes mm -hmm. me a terrible conversationalist and listener. So my awkwardness would make me shut in, shut down. And so my introverts listening, this is often what happens when you feel awkward, you're afraid of a silence or being judged. You shut in, you close down, you stop talking. Other people, my extroverts, their awkwardness dresses up as something else. Their awkwardness dresses up as showing off over the top, being a drama queen, talking too much. Some of my extroverted, awkward friends, they'll say, sometimes I can't, I just can't stop talking. Literally my mouth just keeps going. And so awkwardness is this really interesting way that we try to cover our fear. And so when I say I'm a recovering awkward person, I've had to conquer a lot of internal fear to be able to have interactions that I desperately, desperately want to have. That could be in a professional setting, sharing my ideas, but it also could be just trying to make good friends, trying to be open with my partner and so I think that charisma is this lubricant because awkwardness makes our relationships, our conversations, our communication crunchy, awkward, halty. We talk too much. We talk too little. There's an awkward silence. We don't know what to do with our hands, right? We're like, what do I do with my body language? We make weird faces. We awkwardly nervous laugh. So my, my goal with charisma, what I've found is that it's a smoother, it's a lubricant, which I just, I, we have to stick with that metaphor. Well, it's hilarious. Yeah. And it also makes it, it, it you, when you use the word crunchy about 
those moments when you feel awkward, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because whether you're an over talker, over sharer, nervous laugh, interrupting people because you're extroverted, but you feel afraid of how people are going to view you, or whether you withdraw because you're afraid, that crunchiness is that sort of disruption you feel internally. And so I love this idea that charisma, which you say is a skill that anybody can develop, Mm -hmm. that charisma helps you be yourself and it helps you be more influential and it helps you enjoy social settings, whether you're introverted or extroverted. That's what, that's what I'm kind of getting from this. Oh, that's it. And so I think that what we're looking for here is a lot of people talk about confidence and I love confidence, but I am not naturally confident. And so what would happen is I would say, just be more confident. Like I would, you know, I'd be like trying to mantra myself into it. And if you tell someone who's awkward to just stop being awkward, it, it doesn't work. Oh, so it just I, makes you more awkward, I think, because then you're it, now focused on the it, fact that you're awkward. It's like a meta meta, right? Like I worry that I'm a worrier and that, mm-hmm. that makes me worry. You know? <laughs> so, right. So like, it's like a horrible meta. So what I say is, okay, I like confidence, but let's put it to the side for a second. Let's talk about being purposeful. Purposeful is much more impactful and active. It's, it's an active emotion. Okay. So if I say, I want to show up in this interaction as highly charismatic, I want to be my warmest self and my most confident self. And I want to clearly signal with purpose, the other person, I am trustworthy and likable, but I can also get it done. I'm powerful and capable. The key here is the balance. Most of us have an imbalance. So there's four segments of the population. This is what the research finds. There's the sweet spot of highly charismatic people, high warmth, high competence. That's the rare birds among us. Now, can you give us an example of somebody who is highly charismatic? Let's do the classic Oprah. Okay. Oprah is highly charismatic and here's why she can be in an interview and she can make the other person feel so comfortable. They share their darkest secrets. That's warmth. Mm. That's trust. She can cry with the other person. She can mimic their facial expressions. She, her warmth literally draws out other people's warmth. However, you also take her very seriously. You know, she is smart. She knows her answers. You can't sneak something by her. And that's her signaling. I'm competent. I'm going to make sure that I get to the truth here. You can rely on me to ask the hard questions. That's the perfect example. What Oprah does and what most charismatic people do, which I want to teach everyone who's listening how to do, is you can use charisma like a dial. It's just like a thermostat. So in some situations, when you want to dial up a little bit extra warmth, you can use more warmth cues. And Oprah does this exceptionally well. In her hard-hitting interviews, she'll dial up competence. She'll hit them with the hard questions. Go watch her interview with Lance Armstrong. I talk about uh, Lance Armstrong a lot in the book. I pick on him a lot. Her interview with Lance Armstrong, she is high competence. She has just enough warmth to make him feel comfortable, but she asks hard questions. Versus some of her other interviews, she's dialing up warmth. She wants to make the other person feel comfortable. So that's an example of someone who's very uh, nice balance and kind of uses her warmth and competence as a dial. Let's look at, for example, Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs is- Zero warmth. Am am I? No, zero warmth. Zero warmth. Zero warmth. What a, the guy's a jerk. Zero warmth. So he is the perfect example of high, high, high competence. He has, he's constantly signaling, take me seriously. I'm powerful. And most importantly, what highly smart people don't realize is if they- over signal competence, people see them as cold, intimidating, not a collaborator, not a team player, hard to talk to. So yes, he, he was brilliant, but his lack of warmth made people feel like he wasn't a collaborator. He wasn't a good team player. And his legacy is changing the world, but also being not kind. So that's an example of high competence. My highly smart people, my engineers, my really technically brilliant folks, they often get trapped and high competence because they don't know how to signal warmth. Mm. By the way, they might have all the intention to be a collaborator, but we are not taught how to signal warmth. And so they go, well, guess I don't know how to do that. So that's wow. okay. high competence. That's one bucket. And by the way, so if you're, as you're listening, I want you to think about what sounds like you, what feels like you. So do you feel like you have the balance? Do you feel like, no, you're off the charts on competence? You know, 
you're high in competence. If people always think you're in charge, you know, you're high in competence. If people have ever told you that you're intimidating or hard to talk to, you know, that you're in a relationship or have a partner who's high in competence. If they constantly Google fact check you. <laughs> so highly competent folks, their mission is to get it right. They are very uh, dominated by the idea of get it right, get the facts. And so they'll be in a conversation with you and be like, let me Google fact check that. Let me just see if that's, <laughs> that's right. Do they share their emotions if they're high competent? Usually less. They're much less comfortable sharing their emotions because vulnerability, sharing emotions is an aspect of warmth. So that mm. is one way that competent people can hack warmth is sharing more of their emotions. But usually they don't like that as much because emotions aren't correct, right? It's hard to be right with emotions. So they'll often, the reason why a highly competent partner, I have one of those, is I, I'm going to use the word afraid of emotions or uncomfortable with emotions is because it can't be fact checked, right? Hmm. If someone says as a partner, um, I feel upset with you, how do you verify that? How do you fix it? Where's the solution? A highly competent partner, they love solving things, right? You come to them and you're like, I'm just having a bad day. And they're like, let me fix that for you. And you're like, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. And they're like, oh, no, I don't know how to do that. Cause they're fixers. Got it. So highly competent people, you have that super strength of, of getting it right, being fixers. Warm folks, my warm folks. So my highly warm folks, you are filled with empathy, your cheerleaders, your supporters, your mission. So if competent people want to get it right, highly warm people want to be liked. They want everyone to feel good. They want everyone to feel comfortable. Typically, highly warm folks, their super strength is empathy, nurturing, making people feel loved and warm, but they often give too much of themselves in sacrifice of being liked. Got it. So like people pleasing doormats is what you're talking about. That's the far end. People yes. pleasing is what they struggle with. And so I think that highly warm folks in the workplace, this is the other really important thing to understand is if you are highly warm, you are fighting a battle in yourself, which is your desire to be liked gets in the way of your need to be respected. Mm. Okay. Stop. I need everybody to hear that. If you default and you are too warm, especially at work, your need to be liked is getting in the way of your need to be respected. Yeah. And when you are too focused on getting it right and too focused on being smart and too focused on dominating the conversation or the knowledge bank, your need to be right is dominate. It, 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 how did you say your need to be need right? To be right is getting in the way of your need to be liked. Yes. Yes. Your need to be right is getting in the way of your need to be liked. That even rhymes. That's amazing. I didn't I want to go that on purpose. <laughs> I want to go back to something in the very beginning that we were talking about. Yes. So when I asked you what is charisma yeah, and you said it has nothing to do with personality it has nothing to do with introversion or extroversion. It is not about being confident that charisma is something that you display to other people, correct? Yes. And charisma matters because if you have charisma, people trust you, they like you, they count on you, which I would think means it makes you in more influential, it makes you more successful, it makes you have greater influence. Is that what the benefits of charisma are? Influence, impact, and income. So the reason Whoa. why- Hold yeah. on, hold on. So charisma yeah. impacts the three eyes. The three eyes, all three of them. Why? If you are warm and competent, you are less likely to be underestimated. You're less likely to be dismissed and doubted. Why? We are attracted to highly charismatic people because charisma is contagious. And they have actually proven this in the lab. The more charismatic you are, the more you clearly and purposefully, I keep using the word purposeful on purpose, the more clearly you signal warmth and competence, the more contagious you are. We like to be around warm, competent people because they make us more warm and competent. And so nonverbal signals, vocal signals, verbal signals, we are constantly aware of because we want to catch them. 
So the reason why we're drawn to people who are the in that influence piece, that influence or impact piece is because we are influenced by people who we want to be contagious with. Mm. We also want to be more warm and competent. So if we're around someone who's warm and competent, it makes us feel like our best selves. If you think about the most, the most charismatic person, you know, so just think about them for a second. They make you feel better. They make you feel like your best self. That's the difference. I think between, for example, a highly charismatic person and a narcissist, right? Like this is not just about confidence. It's about someone who actually is positively infectious. And they've proven this with both negative and positive cues. So for example, um, Dr. Matthew Lieberman at UCLA, he flashed people a fear microexpression. So fear microexpression is when we raise our eyebrows up our forehead and we white, widen our eyes to our white show and we take in a deep breath. So we go, <gasps> yes. So that expression, if he flashes that expression to someone in a fMRI, their amygdala, where they process fear, begins to activate. We catch the fear. Literally just seeing someone with a fear face makes us feel afraid. The most important part of this experiment though is the moment that someone labeled the fear. So in their head or out loud said, fear, it deactivated their amygdala. Hmm. In other words, being aware of the cues that are being sent to us, both negative and positive, makes us aware of who is infecting us. So that influence, that impact is that highly charismatic people are so clear with their signals. They're, it's like they're gifting, another Oprah reference, they're gifting warmth for you, competence for you, charisma for you, and not charismatic people, people who are anxious, afraid, awkward, they are signaling negative cues. That's why we don't want to be around them. We don't want to catch that fear, right? Like we don't want that fear. And so we're like, whoa, I don't like those signals. And so we avoid them as much as we possibly can. You know what I love about your research? What I love is that, first of all, you're about to teach us all how to become more charismatic. You're oh, yeah. also about to give us hacks related to body language and getting intentional about what we're displaying and signaling. Yes. But what I also love about your research is that I need everybody listening to understand something. Right now, you are unintentionally sending signals and cues to people. That's it. You are walking around and whether it's a negative mood or it's anxiety or it's insecurity or it's awkwardness or you're so focused on being right that you don't realize that you're sending signals and cues that make people not like you and not trust you or you're so focused on being liked and that you're sending these signals of being a warm pushover, which is why you're never respected and why you're passed over at work. And so what I love about this research is that you're helping us focus on two factors that you can display that will increase influence, impact, and income. And it doesn't matter whether you're shy or whether you're bossy. These strategies are going to work for all of us. Mm -hmm. One thing I would love for you to talk about before we talk about the cues is this. So in that study that you cited from Princeton, yes. they also found that charisma accounts for 82% of how people evaluate you. So can you unpack that? because I think it's really important for us to understand this is not only a good idea because you're going to make more money, be more influential, and make a bigger impact. Based on the science, this is how people view you. And so can 82%. you unpack this for us? So I was also shocked by that number. By the way, it's very rare to see a number that big in science, right? Especially because if I were to ask someone, how do you want to be perceived? You're going to get a list of a hundred adjectives, funny, extroverted, bubbly, attractive, whatever. Actually, when someone is interacting with us, and by the way, this is not just in person. This is on your LinkedIn profile, in Zoom, on the phone, in chats, in Slack, in DMs, in your email inbox. People are using warmth and competent signals to make up 82% of their judgment of you. Okay, stop. Everybody, did you just hear that? People are using 
warmth and confidence, which are the two things that make up your charisma. 82% of how people judge you, evaluate you, size you up, decide to hire or date you has to do with whether or not you're warm or confident. That's bananas. It's bananas. And it's not just your first impression. It's actually every single impression. So yes, your first impression is important, but even if you don't feel you've had a good first impression, that's okay. We are reevaluating this on every Zoom call. If someone sees your name pop up in their inbox, they're also wondering, is this, a, is this a warm and competent email? In other words, can I trust this email? Can I rely on this email? The hmm. more warm and competent your email is, the faster response rates you're going to get. We as humans have a really hard time responding to, connecting with, building rapport with, being impacted by people who under signal or people who signal in an imbalanced way. So what we're talking about here, that 82% is making it easier for people to interact with you. I believe that your warmth and competence tells the world how they should treat you. Wow. So and you it, here's what I treated. believe, Vanessa. You want to hear what I believe, Vanessa? Yes. I believe we all have a huge blind spot when it comes to what we're signaling other people. That you may think you know how you come across and what you're displaying, but I have a feeling that we are about to learn from Vanessa <laughs> that we have a massive blind spot when it comes to warmth and confidence and how you're displaying charisma or not. So how can we, number one, figure out how charismatic we are? What okay. do we do, Vanessa? Okay. All right. So first, we're at, the first kind of diagnostic that I talked about was just which one sounds more like you. That's where we start, right? So where do you think you fall? You hire in warmth, hire in competence, you have a balance, or are you under signaling, right? Do you shut down and not signal enough? Okay. The next thing you can do is you can actually do our diagnostic. It's totally free. And I love this because there's two ways that you want to, I want you to do this. You can take this as many times as you want. The whole point, I, the reason I put it up from the research is because I want people to be able to Take a diagnostic, see how they come across. So they're going to be very simple questions. Does that mean like, a test? Yes, it's a test. Okay. Really simple test, sciencepeople.com slash charisma. Wait, hold on. Wait. What's a, what, what, what is, what is the URL? Scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. Scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. Wait, is that the New York Times science of people? No, just my <clears throat> science of people. Oh, that's your site. Okay. Scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. We will put that in the show notes. So you can take this test. As many times as you want. And so first I want you to take it as you. I want you to take it as you. And I want you to take it not on your ideal self, your real self. Okay. Okay. okay? So on a, on a normal day, I want you to screenshot your results. Then what I want you to do is I want you to do a 360 review. I want you to send the quiz to a partner, a friend, a colleague and ask them to take it as you. This is the key because it's going to show you how other people see you and mm -hmm. have them screenshot the results and then go to dinner and get a lot of wine because it'll be a great <laughs> conversation. <laughs> so do you find that most people have no idea how they're showing up with other you, people? You were right. Most of us have a blind spot. We think, we hope, we think of ourselves as our ideal selves. And there are days, of course, where we are a little closer to that sweet spot of warmth and competence. But what's really key, what we find is that not only are people giving them different results, but they even might even have different results for home and work. So they're showing up as two selves. And that's a very important thing to know about yourself. If you're going to work and you're dreading it, you're burnt out, you're drained, it could be that you are not honoring who you truly are because you're either under signaling competence or under signaling warmth or trying to fake it till we make it. I have a little problem with that phrase. I don't love that phrase because I, I think it. that the problem is if you're going to fake warmth, it's exhausting, right? And so this is also a way to sort of get a very quick snapshot in how are people perceiving you and is it what you think you're showing? Um, you also have a suggestion that we record our Zoom calls in order to read how charismatic we are. That sounds horrible. It's horrible. I'm not going to lie. It is horrible. And not only do I want you to record a Zoom call, I want you to record a Zoom call that you worked hard on. Presentation, an important client meeting, a call, and then I want you to code it. So when we talk what about- What does code it mean? Okay. So when we talk about cues, so cues are the social signals humans send to each other. Okay. There are four different modes of cues. Verbal, the one we talk about the most, so our words. This is what we most of us think about all the time. We want to prepare the perfect answer, 
share the perfect presentation, we practice our stories. So verbal is only one mode of cues. Second is nonverbal, our body language, our gestures, our facial expressions. The third, the most important one that's overlooked is voice tone, our vocal power, our volume, our pace, our cadence, our tone. And the last smallest one is ornaments, the jewelry we wear, what's behind us in our background, uh, the, the color of our nails, how we wear our hair, our glasses, those are the ornaments. What I want you to do is I want you to code yourself for every cue that you're showing. Everything from how many gestures you're using to what your facial expressions are doing, to your movement, to your fidgeting, to your vocal power, to the kinds of words you're using. That's also going to give you a snapshot because what we've found in our research is that there are certain very clear signals of warmth, cues of warmth, and cues of competence. And the last one are danger zone cues, cues that are negative. My goal, this is a way that you can see is how are you signaling warmth and competence? What are you doing with your body and your, va your voice and your face that's making people treat you the way that they're treating you? Okay. So <laughs> I, I feel like everybody needs to grab a pen yeah. and a piece of paper. And this is definitely one of those podcast episodes that I know Every single parent is going to be forwarding to their kids who have interviews yes. because we are about to get the cheat sheet, everybody, for how to nail charisma, whether you're in a virtual meeting, whether you're in an interview, whether you're sending an email. And so let's go through the cues. All right. What is the easiest way to walk through these? All right. Do you want to go by warmth? Do you want to go by like, do you want to go like, how do you want to do this? Because there's a lot to cover. Yeah, so let's do it by time. So what I wanna do is actually wanna do the first 10 seconds of your, your video, the first minute of your video, that actually helps us break it down. Cause actually the first 10 seconds are really important. The first 10 seconds of you being on camera. Really? So, yeah, because um, it sets you up for the rest of the time. So if you can nail your first 10 seconds, it makes the next hour easier. Wow, that, what, that's so, so what do we have to do? Okay. What are we doing? So, so, so you're about to tell us yes. in the first 10 seconds yes. of a Zoom meeting, you yes. must do this in order to be influential. What do you do? Okay. First 10 seconds. And I want you to code this if you did this on your last video. So here's what you should do. And here's what you should code. Number one, in the first second, you should try to show your hands. I know this sounds really weird, but they use eye tracking studies and they found that one of the first places the brain looks when they're trying to gauge someone's warmth is hands. Why? This is actually a survival mechanism. Back in our caveman days, if we were approached by a stranger caveman, we wanted to see if they were carrying a rock or a spear, right? So this still remains. Something interesting happens. I'll do a little experiment for you. So if you're watching the video, um, I'm going to hide my hands. If you're listening, I'm hiding my hands right now. Yeah. The moment you can't see someone's hands. So if I were to give this entire interview with my hands behind my back, something interesting would happen in your brain and Mel's brain, which is that your amygdala would begin to activate. And that's because when you can't see someone's hands, you wonder, what, what is she holding? What, mm. What's her intention? And so the longer I keep my hands behind my back, the more distracted you should become with the fact yes. that my hands are behind my back. You, you want them to come back out, right? Yes. Okay, they're back, right? Okay, there they are. <sighs> Hello. Yes. So much better. So this is a survival mechanism. The moment you hop on video, walk on stage, walk into a boardroom. Like walk put your hands date. up like, hey, everybody. Hey, good morning. Nice to okay. see you. Okay, okay. So the Easy. first 10 seconds, we turn on, the camera's coming on. We put the hands up. Hi, yeah. everybody. Or just one, right? Like a little okay. wave, nice to see you. You're, you walk into a crowded restaurant to see your date. Hey, good to see you. That hand gesture immediately deactivates their fear processing. Easy, okay? So I want them visible. Second little bonus tip here is the space, the distance. And I literally want you to measure this. The distance between your nose and the camera. The reason for this is because in person, we are very aware of what's called proxemic zones. Proxemic zones are the space between people. So we know, and this is a little bit different culture to culture. So hand gestures universally, we like to see hands, but culture to culture, we also like to know how, what's the distance between people. So I highly recommend, make sure your camera is at least a foot and a half away from your face. Okay. The reason for this is because imagine if I were to give, now I'm gonna get really close to the camera. Imagine if I were to give my entire interview really close, you'd be like, <laughs> Vanessa, back up, back up. Oh right? my God. I totally like lean into the camera. I, 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 I have no 
space above my head. I like my whole face right in there. So maybe I got to back off a little bit on the camera. Let's talk about this for a second. Okay. So there are no bad cues in the sense of they're all purposeful. When you are really close, and I, I love your videos. I've seen your close-up videos. You should know on purpose, if you are very close to the camera, right up in your face, you are signaling intimacy. You are Ooh. signaling, I'm right up in it. And that's because as humans, there are four different proxemic zones, the public zone, the social zone, the personal zone, and the intimate zone. We reserve the intimate zone, which is zero to 18 inches away, zero to a foot and a half away for people we feel really close with. So our partners, our parents, so does our best friends. And so actually when I watch your videos where you're really close, I feel like we're besties. Mm. Now tell me, tell me <laughs> everything. So I would say reserve those videos for your intimate moments. Okay. You're literally signaling them. So in a normal Zoom call, I want you at least a foot and a half away. It also helps you show your hands, right? It helps oh, have those gestures. So Easy. smart. Okay. Easy. So the first 10, the first 10 seconds, everybody, we got the hands up and we got to be about a foot and a half away. Yep. Because this is, oh, and there's more? Oh, there's more. Okay. There's so much more. Okay, second, vocal. So that was a nonverbal cue. I want you to make sure you are not accidentally using the question inflection on your name or an important information. The question inflection is when we go up at the end of our sentence. So it sounds like we're asking a question. And so often we found in our lab that people would use the question inflection in the first 10 seconds, which made people doubt them. So I'm gonna, I want to share this study because this study gave me the chills when I first heard it. And I think it's so incredibly important for people who are listening who want to be taken seriously. So what they did in this study, I promise I won't get too into the science. Very simply, they brought doctors into their lab and they wanted to know if people would change their perceptions of charisma based on their voice tone. So they asked the doctors to record 10 second voice tone clips. So these clips, they had to say their name, where they worked and their specialty. So it sounded like this. I use my lipstick as an example. Hi, my name is Dr. Edwards. I specialize in oncology and I work at Children's Presbyterian Hospital. They took these clips and they warbled the words. So you could hear the volume, the pace, the cadence, but not the actual words being said. So that sounded like this. Okay. They asked participants to then rate these doctors on warmth and competence. Based on the warbled thing that you just did? Yes. So imagine that I just did that. And then I asked you, do you like this person? Is this person smart? So participants rated these gobbledygook clips on, do they like this person? This person smart. They found the doctors who had the lowest warmth and competence ratings had the highest rate of malpractice lawsuits. What? The doctors with the lowest warmth and competence ratings simply based on their voice tone, had the highest rate of malpractice lawsuits. This implies that we don't just dislike people based on their skills. We dislike people based on our perception of their skills. And that happens within the first few seconds of hearing them. The biggest wow. pattern, it, it's, it was such a, it's such a shockwave through the community because these are, these are doctors who are very well trained. What they found was patterns there were certain doctors who across the board were rated as highly charismatic from gobbledygook. And there were certain doctors that over and over again, they were rated as not very smart, not very likable. Here was the biggest pattern, up talk. The doctors who had an introduction like this, hi, my name is Dr. Edwards. I specialize in oncology and I work at Children's Presbyterian Hospital. <laughs> right? What it did is it changes the way that we listen. They found that when we hear the question inflection accidentally used on a statement, our prefrontal cortex shifts from listening to scrutinizing. Mm. We think, why did they just question themselves? I guess I should question them. We hear this all the time in sales calls where someone is killing it in a pitch. This is, what, this is the income, the, the last I, or in a salary negotiation. I'd love to work for your company. I, I think this, I'd be a great fit for you. I love your mission. And I'm really looking for a salary range of over $100,000. <laughs> oh, everybody, did you hear that question? Yeah. I'm really looking for a salary range of um, $100,000. When you ask your price, you are begging people to negotiate with you. 
you're telling people, I don't really believe this number and you shouldn't believe it either. So what happens in the first 10 seconds is we're nervous, right? We're really nervous. We've been holding our breath. We're waiting for Zoom call. And so we accidentally give away all of our vocal power in the first 10 seconds. We say, hey, everyone, uh, my name is Vanessa. We'll get started in a few. Whoa. Okay. I just, this is why it's important to tape a Zoom call you're on, everybody. Yeah. Because now you have three research-backed, incredibly subtle but profound behavior changes that you need to make immediately. Immediately. Hands up. You got to have the right distance, which is a foot to a foot and a half nose to camera. No up talk, everybody. And I, I would imagine that most people don't realize that they do it. No idea. That's why coding is so important. That's why seeing yourself, that's why we don't realize when we walk into a salary negotiation or we walk into a pitch meeting with a client or we go on a date and we think it went well, right? How often have people been sideswiped and they think, yeah, I think that went great, but I didn't get a call back or I didn't get a second date. It's because you are accidentally telling the world how to treat you. And if you under signal warmth, people don't like you. If you under signal competence, people don't take you seriously. And the up talking everyone. Oh is when you're under signaling competence. competence. You might be the most competent and and qualified person, but if you walk into that interview and you don't, you know, not sure, like it, my last job was great. I think I'd do great here. I, you know, 100,000, that would be, that'd be great. Like if, if, if you just shot yourself in the foot. Yeah. And you don't even realize it because you don't hear it. I bet people do this with dating all the time. All the time. And the problem is it's a, it's a permission-seeking behavior. So if we really get down to the root cause of it, which is, which is one thing that fascinates me is this is appeasement body language, right? So this is, do you like me? Do you agree with me? So oftentimes highly warm people who really, really desperately want to be liked use more up talk because they're asking, do you agree? Do you like me? The crazy thing is, <laughs> so is it annoying. actually the opposite effect, right? So that I also want you to get really to the root cause of if you hear yourself do up talk. And by the way, please go listen to your voicemail. So go listen to your voicemail or any voice recordings. If you've sent any voice recordings or voice memos in the past few days, go re-listen to them and see if you accidentally use up talk and go re-record. Go re-record. So how do you coach somebody who has a style of speaking where they naturally end sentences with this up talk. So it's almost like you've got a statement and, and as you speak it, it sounds like a question at the end. Yes. And do women do this more than men? Yes. So women do this more than men. Also, the research finds that women typically, but not always, are seen as higher in warmth. And that's because from a very young age, women are often taught to be liked. And so they tend to dial up their warmth earlier. Typically, but not always, men are seen as higher in competence. And that's because often men are told to be right. Mm. So we also have to be aware of those gender differences. So yes, women typically more often use um, up talk or high warmth. So luckily, this is actually a very easy thing to fix. So we're going to okay. do it. We're going to do it with breath and pausing. So one of the things that can happen with up talk is we're nervous and we're speaking very quickly. And so what I want you to think about is what do you want to say with purpose and how can you deliver it with purpose? So there's three kinds of inflection. There's up talk. So going up at the end of our sentence, there's neutral going up, going, staying neutral at the end of our sentence. And there's the downward inflection, which is very commanding, which is going down at the end of our sentence. Okay. So all mm. three of those things signal something very, very different. What I want you to pay attention to is the tension in your vocal cords. So when we are tense, when we're nervous, we tend to take in a breath and talk at the top of our breath. It's really, really hard to sound confident when we're up here. So what I want you to do is when you say hello or your first few words, I want you to speak on the out breath. Okay. What most people do is they hold their breath before they get on a Zoom call or a phone call. So they go, hello, all the way up here. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're right. Because you're like, hi. 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 Oh, so good to see you. So we did this 
experiment where we had people submit recordings of important phone calls. And we found the highest part of the entire call, up talk and vocal tone, was the first 10 seconds. Literally, people would go, hey, it's so good to see you. So how's it going? That's a thousand percent right. So this is really easy to fix. What do you and do? Instead of holding your breath, I want you to speak on the outbreath. So let's do a little experiment. I want you to hear the highest end of your range. So the highest end of your range is when you speak at the top of your breath. So on the count of three, I want us to say, and wherever you are, if you can do this in your car, tell your kids to do it with you. So I want you to take in a deep breath and say hello at the top of your breath. So it's going to sound like this. One, two, three. Hello. So you want to try it with me, Mel? Yeah, okay. I do. One, two, three. Hello. 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 Yeah. Hi. Okay. It's very so high. That's the highest end of your breath. If you hear your range going up there, you are speaking too high. You hear yourself go there. What I want you to do is try to relax your vocal cords by speaking on the out breath. Hello. So this time, there you go. That was it. <laughs> so you just heard the difference. So here's my difference. Ready? Hello. Hello. Those are both me, but they sound totally different. So this time what we're going to do is we're going to take a deep breath in on the count of three. And I want you to say hello on the out breath. I want you to say okay. it in a downward inflection. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Hello. Hello. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm. Nice that deep sounded voice. good. Yes. Okay. So signaling competence. Uh, we now have a bunch of things that you can do, including, and probably one of the most important is learning how to take a breath and then talk yes. on the out breath. I, can I add one more competence cue that I think Please? is really easy? Yes. Really easy. Okay. So hand gestures, there's two sides of hand gestures. One is visible, right? So we mentioned having a little, you know, wave, hello, greeting at the, at the top of a video call or in person. The next thing we look for in hand gestures is purpose. What highly competent people did. So we did a research study where we analyzed thousands of hours of TED talks. Okay. I was curious, why do some TED talks go viral and some don't? So in our lab, we analyzed thousands of hours, counting cues, coding. We literally coded TED talks and looked at the view count. We found that the most viral TED Talks use an average of 465 gestures in 18 minutes, whereas the least popular TED Talks use an average of 272 gestures. It's almost half. What happens here is the best TED Talkers, they get on stage and they typically go, good morning. So they have a visible hand out of their pockets right in front. And then what they do, I'm going to demo this for you. Um, and by the way, if you're just listening, I'm going to show some hand gestures along with my words. Mel, see if this looks familiar to you. <clears throat> this is every popular TED Talk. Today, I <laughs> wanna talk to you about a big idea. It's gonna change your life in three different ways. That is cueing the brain to say, wow, this person knows their content so well, they can speak to me on two tracks. They can speak to me with their verbal, but they can also demo their concepts along with their words. So if I were to say, today I have a really big idea and hold up my hands like I'm holding a penny, you're like, Vanessa, it looks so small. Your brain is more likely to believe my gesture than my word. Wow. Wow. Okay. So let me just say, if you want to watch this, go to youtube.com slash Mel Robbins. This yes. entire episode, the unabridged version, we put them up there. You can check it out. And it was very interesting because when you said big idea, what she did, everybody, is she held up her fingers, like making that gesture when, like imagine if I were like, it's really puny. Tiny. And now I'm making that tiny little, like my fingers are like a quarter inch apart. <laughs> when she said it's a big idea and she showed me the hand signal for puny, Vanessa's dead right. My brain went right to the hand gesture. And I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't match. Why the heck is she saying puny? Like, why is she not saying puny? Because clearly it's a puny idea if she's making it. That's really interesting. So that this is where I think inauthenticity comes from. So people who are inauthentic are saying one thing with their words, but they're nonverbal, their vocal doesn't match. And our brain does not like this. Our brain is like, wait a minute, that was incongruent, right? Like that didn't work. So, and by the way, this is very hard to do. So everyone who's listening, I want to do a little experiment with you. What I want you to do in a second is I want you to say five, but I want you to hold up the number three. Okay, ready? Yeah. Five. Five. Oh, that's weird. Oh, horrible. My brain literally went, that's the wrong hand gesture, Mel. <laughs> Your brain was like, stop, stop. 
That is because our brains also like to be congruent. So our brains use our gestures as truth telling. And so what happens is, is there's this really interesting cycle of if you want to be shown up, show up as competent, the other thing you can think about in the first 10 seconds and then throughout is how can you demo a concept with your hands? Now, this is not interpretive dance. I don't want you to like, good morning. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. You know, I love you. <laughs> You're hilarious. <laughs> right. We don't have to do that. But there is a difference of, you know, I'm so happy to be here. I want to talk about two different things in the meeting today. When someone holds up two and they say two, not only does it make you look competent, they think, wow, it really is two. You're also hooking the other person's brain to think, I better remember both. Mm. You become more memorable with more purposeful gestures. People believe your competence when your gestures and your words are congruent. A very easy one. What are mistakes? Mm. that let's start with introverts. What are mistakes that introverts make when mm. it comes to body language? Okay. So uh, one of the biggest mistakes that we have identified, there's, there's a lot of them is with our facial expressions. So I think with our facial expressions, we forget how rich our face is in demonstrating emotions or cueing emotions. So a big mistake that I see is people will fake smile I love smiling, but there is nothing worse than fake smiling. I do not believe in toxic positivity. So people have been told, smile, smile more, which I think is like the worst advice, right? I'm like, smile purposefully, don't smile more. So a really simple mistake is someone will say, yeah, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> Incongruent. Incongruent. So what will happen is an introvert really wants to show up as their best self. They come with the best intention or someone will hop on a video call and they're trying to be positive. And so they'll have a lot of incongruent messages by trying to show warmth with a fake smile. The problem is Dr. Barbara Wilde and her associates, they actually looked at fake smiling. And what they did is they showed people pictures of smiling people, fake smiling people, and neutral people. By the way, just the science of this, a fake smile or a, a real smile reaches all the way up into these upper cheek muscles. So if you were to smile all the way up into your upper cheek muscles, they activate your crow's feet, right? That's Got a it. real smile. Only yes. one in 10 people can consciously activate those muscles. So they really do happen with authentic happiness. Okay. Fake smiles are only on the bottom half of the face. So if I was in a face mask, you could not see my fake smile. Right. But you could see the smile lines in somebody's eyes. If it's real. So a real great. smile you actually make with your eyes. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Upper cheek muscles slash eyes. Exactly. So what happens is what, what happened in this research experiment is she showed people pictures of real smiling people and people caught the happiness. It actually mm. affected their positive mood. They felt happier. When people saw the fake smiles, they caught nothing. In other words, cueing for real happiness actually makes you more contagious. Fake happiness makes you less memorable. Nothing happens. So the biggest mistake that will happen with introverts is they want to come across as warm and their only tool in their toolkit is smiling. The problem is there are, the good thing is there are many other warmth cues. So what are use. the other warmth cues that you can okay. use? Okay. So I would, if you're going to smile, smile for real. And okay. please, please go look at your LinkedIn profile picture. Please, please go look at your dating profile pictures. I either want you neutral sexy or smiling all the way, no fake smiles. Okay. So make sure that smile is all the way up into your eyes. Cause if you have a fake smile in your LinkedIn profile picture, you are literally signaling fake happiness in authenticity. So if you don't want to actually smile, that is totally okay. That's not your only warmth cue. Here are your other warmth options. One, a head nod. So a slow triple nod, one, two, three is an immediate warmth. Signal. <laughs> wow. One, two, three. Okay, right? we can do that, people. Yes. Easy. So, and by the way, the funny thing about this, the research found, this just tickles me, that when someone does a slow triple nod, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the other person speaks 67% longer. Wow. It's like a nonverbal dot, dot, dot. You're literally saying to someone, tell me more. I want to listen. I want to hear you. So a slow triple nod. Oh, I think no, they teach so that to therapists, to don't they? Yes. I think they, they teach the therapist triple nod yes. technique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So a slow triple nod, very easy. You don't have to smile. It just, it's a, it's a warmth cue. The other thing that we found, we did this in LinkedIn profile pictures. If you add a simple head tilt, doop, you are seen as warmer. <laughs> so if I tilt my head to the side, this is a universal response. If I want to hear something better. So if I say, 
Mel, do you hear that? We automatically tilt our head and expose our ear. That's a way that we want to hear better. And so when you are on a video call, on a date, in your LinkedIn profile picture, if you want to be seen as warm, you can tilt your head to the side as if to say, I am deeply listening. I am really trying to hear you. And it's much more natural than smiling maniacally. This is fascinating. Easy. So we've got the triple nod, everybody. We've got smile with your eyes. We've got tilt your head slightly. What are other warm cues? Okay, so other warm cues, vocal. So let's talk about vocal. So those were three nonverbal cues. Vocal, remember, is the one that we often forget. You have a lot of power in your voice. Mm. So another warm vocal cue is what I call vocalizations. Ooh, do we love a vocalization? So a vocalization is surround sound listening. It's, it's showing that you're listening. So this is going to immediately make me sound warmer. Mm. Oh, oh, I just did that. Ooh, I'm oh, very warm. Oh. Mm. Yes. Mm. So actually you have a very good balance smell of warmth and competence. I was going to say you when you asked for an example, but I was like, that's way too brown nosy. So I didn't, but you have, <laughs> you have a very good warmth and competence because you will vocalize for me. So as a speaker, when you nod at me, I can see you nodding right now. Oh right? yeah. I'm just when doing you, it naturally. Yeah. And that encourages me as a speaker. I'm doing good. That makes my crunchiness smoother. Oh, so, that's right? so awesome. So your warmth cues are gifts to awkward people. When you show someone who's crunchy, awkward, afraid, I'm listening to you. Mm, that was interesting. Oh, aha. You are gifting them lubricant. You are saying, you got this girl. Like I'm listening. I am hearing you. This is super smooth, which then makes me more smooth. And so I... There's two sides of why I wrote this book. Yes, I want you to be more charismatic, but I also want you to be more inspiring. I want you to be contagious in a way that's gifting warmth and competence. Mm. And so adding vocalizations is a very easy way, especially for my introverts. Remember my introverts, I want, you, I want to teach you how to be heard without being loud. So nonverbal cues, vocalizations, that's a way for you to participate in conversation without saying a word, right? So, mm. Oh, that's fantastic. Easy. All right. Do that again. So what, what are the, what are the other ones other than, mm? Ooh, ah, wow. What? Those are all warm vocalizations. In fact, doing them to right now should kind of give you the warm and fuzzies like a little bit. She'd be like, mm, that feels so good. So whatever I, I, I say vocalizations are kind of like a warming blanket. It like makes the other person feel like, wow, I'm doing so good. So you're, you're doing better easy. than good. You're doing fantastic, oh. Vanessa. How do you display competence? What are okay. some cues for competence? All right. So competence, um, low tone, which we talked about already. So not using the accidental question inflection is really important. Explanatory gestures. So being purposeful with our gestures, eye contact. Eye contact is a, is a hard one because I know that eye contact can be different for culture, different cultures. But what I want us to understand about eye contact is that eye contact produces a chemical. So when we mutually gaze, and they even found this happens through a screen. So if I make eye contact with the camera, they, we also produce this chemical oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Oxytocin is a very complicated chemical. It does a lot of things in our body, but for social purposes, oxytocin is the chemical of connection. When we are making eye contact, when we first meet someone or we hop on video, our bodies go, oh, we're both mutually gazing. We must be friend, not foe. Therefore, let me produce the chemical that allows me to trust. The more oxytocin that's in our bodies when we're communicating, the more open we are, the more we say yes, the more we feel like, ah, I'm on the same page as this person. So eye contact is one of the fastest ways to get or gift oxytocin. Now, the amount of oxytocin is different. I do not believe, and I really want to repeat this. I do not believe in hundred percent eye contact. Oh, thank oh, God. Okay. Because no. for somebody with, I have ADHD and I've noticed every time I talk, every time I read anything about body language, you're lying if you look away. And I'm like, I have a hard time holding eye contact for a long period of time. And I know it has to do with the ADHD. That, that, is that is correct. So let's talk about this. First of all, I want to talk about looking up to the left is lying because that's a very a myth I want to bust. Second, the worst advice that bad body language books give is make more eye contact. No, eye contact is great and it can produce oxytocin, but actually 
we should not be making 100% eye contact or even 80 or 90% eye contact. That is a territorial gesture. Our bodies know that when we're trying to process something mentally, we look away. So for example, if I were to ask you to do some, some math with me, Mel, if I were to say, Mel, what's 10 times 10 plus uh, five minus, oh. wait, I'm not gonna make you do it, but you immediately well, it's, break it's eye contact. 105. Okay. <clears throat> I looked up to do the math. Yeah, you looked up. I and now I never noticed that, but you're right. I like I looked up to go like I looked up at an imaginary chalkboard and That's imagine it. ten times ten plus five one oh five. And this is a really important thing for humans to do. Why? If I ask you a complicated question, a technical question, even a memory-based question, oh, tell me about your last job, tell me about your last girlfriend, you need to look up to access the memory or to access the knowledge. You do? So, like, is that a, like a neurological thing? Yes, yes. Because when, think about this from a, from a chemical perspective, when we are talking and we are bonding, I wanna make eye contact. But if you ask me a hard question about my past or a math problem, I need to break the eye contact, stop producing the oxytocin so I can access that memory. So it's our brain's way of saying, don't give me too much input. I need to access this input and this information over here. So that's why it can be so confusing for people who are trying to make more eye contact. No, right. I want you to make eye contact when you want to bond with someone. Absolutely. Especially in the first few seconds. But when you're processing or accessing information, I actually want you to look away because you're going to give a better answer. And humans understand this, right? So if I were to, if you were to ask me a very hard question that I didn't know the answer to, and I went, huh, that's a great question. You are more likely to believe my answer because oh, I looked wow. away to process it. That's yeah. fascinating. So um, that's the first thing I want to bust about eye contact is do not feel pressure to make more eye contact. Competent people make purposeful eye contact. Competent people, they know that when they're trying to bond and connect, they're right at you. But when they're trying to access a competent answer, they're accessing it over here or over here or hmm. over here. So that's actually a mark of competence. It's also a way to pause to introduce, I am deeply thinking about what you just said, so I can give you a really good answer. Second thing is we have done a ton of lie detection research in our lab. In fact, I almost, almost, we have one chapter on lie detection in the book. I almost put it into its own book because it's, it's so much research. I wanna bust a myth. Looking up to the left or looking up to the right does not mean someone is lying. That means someone is accessing different information. What I do think that people should do is know their lying tells. I think a fundamental piece of information every single person should know about themselves is what they do when they lie. So here's what oh, I wait, want to Hold do. on. Let me just make sure I, I'm, so you're not saying here's a tell when someone else is lying. You're saying, what is the tell when you're lying? That's it. <laughs> oh, why do I need to know that? You need to know that because you need to know when you are accidentally signaling inauthenticity. Because what can often happen is you should know your own lying tell because hopefully you're not lying a lot. But oftentimes people will do their lying tell when they're not even lying, when they're nervous oh, or afraid. Okay. And it's signaling to the world, I'm nervous and afraid. What's your lying tell? So my lying tell is I hide my hands. So I get my hands get really cold and I usually hide them or I clench them. So if you see me ever have like a clenched fist, I'm like, keep it together, keep it together, keep it together, keep it together. So a clenched fist or white knuckling it, or I hide my hands. I also um, use a little bit of a disgust microexpression. So we talked about fear as a microexpression. Disgust is when we uh, crinkle our nose up and we flash the whites of our teeth. Uh, this is a, uh, like if I, I were to say, oh, I smell something bad. Disgust is a really common lying red flag because liars, including myself, we hate lying. It makes us feel dirty. Literally lying makes us feel dirty. Liars will often use more Purell afterwards because they, they, it makes them feel physically dirty. Mm -hmm. So you'll see people, if you ask someone, so uh, what do you think of the new girl? Oh yeah, you know, she's she's nice. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a disgust face as you say that. Yeah. And now as I'm watching you, I'm like, you're lying because totally. you're saying she's nice, but your face says disgust. Yeah. So, so how do you though know your own tell? Because I'm sitting here trying to think. No, well, have, I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the I know what it is. fun. This is a fun Friday night. If you're willing to to kind of do this with a couple of friends, it's really fun to do this. I highly recommend doing this with your partner. I, my my partner and I know are each other's tells, okay. which has made our marriage super honest, which I love, like radical honesty. I'm all about it. So here's what I want you to do. Okay. Get ready, Chris. 
You got date night. <laughs> get ready. One, if you can film this also, it's helpful to rewatch it together. First, oh, God. I want you to open up your camera or your phone. One, I want you to tell me what you had for breakfast yesterday. Okay. The reason for this remember. is a recall test. You need to know what you look like when you're recalling truth. You will notice you'll probably look up to left or look up to the right. Yeah, I look to touch the your left. Face or touch your face. I kind of, I looked to the left and then I looped my head around. Okay. So that's, and you also were tapping your foot. You're, you're shaking was your I? Foot. Oh, I was. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. So that's your recall test. That's what you look like when you are accessing truthful information. You're right. right. I, you know why I click my foot? It's like I'm cranking the brain back up. Come on. I still can't it. remember what the hell I had for breakfast yesterday, even though I'm <laughs> cranking the foot and I'm looking to the left, but it's okay. You're like, what was it? What was it? What was what it? What is what today? Was yesterday was thir- Sunday. I, I can't remember what I had for breakfast. If I, if I made you sit and, and think about it, by the way, it's okay if it takes you a couple of seconds to think about it. We'll see exactly what you look like or what Mel looks like when she's recalling truth. Oh, I'm like scrunching my face up right now. Yeah. I'm not sure I had breakfast yesterday. And that could be the answer. Yeah. I don't think I ate breakfast yesterday. So we just okay. saw what Mel looks like when she is recalling truth. Okay. Right? Okay. That's very important to know about someone because if you ask your teenage daughter, did you hear about the uh, drug incident at school? And they use truthful recall cues. You're good. Okay, right? cool. Truthful I like this recall. Game. Yeah. So how do I know when I'm lying? It's coming. Okay. Okay. So good. the second question I want you to answer the camera. <laughs> and by the way, what was it? What was, what did I have for breakfast? I don't think I ate anything. Okay, good. Okay. Got it. So you can do this all in one take. It's even better. Like I like the pausing. We want to see what you do in those moments of like, what was it? What was it? Okay. Second question. I want you to tell me your most embarrassing story. The more embarrassing, the better. I want to deliver it right to camera. This is how you look when you're recalling something that makes you nervous. The biggest mistake that we make in lie detection is we confuse nervousness for guilt. Got it. They are different. So when you recall your most embarrassing story, and I want you to like feel it, you know, like really feel it. I want you to see what you do when you're nervous. That's your nervous tell. And those are also things you don't want to show when you're trying to come across as confident because they're your nervous leaks. So common nervous tells are mashing the lips. Oh, I think I just did that. Yeah. We like try to hold it in. Yeah. Uh, Common nervous tells are uh, um, touching the stomach, the face. That's often we're like, oh, nervous. Do people well, do this on Zoom calls too? You see them doing this? All the time. All the time. All the time. It's a great way to, I mean, I don't want you to like do this to your colleagues about them knowing it. It's always good to do it honestly, but it's very helpful to know. Like on my team, we do team calls every week. It's oh my God, I would hate to be on a team call with When I'm making someone nervous. <laughs> What'd you say? It's helpful to know when I'm making a teammate nervous, right? Like I have a a wonderful big team. And if I share, oh, we're having a big new year's launch and how does everyone feel? And I know my team members nervous tell, and I see it on a zoom call. I can say, Hey Rob, are we, are we good on that? Like any, any hesitations, any hangups that then gives him permission to say, I don't know if the graphics are going to be ready in time. So a deeper way to interact, I believe is radical honesty where on my team, we know each other's nervous tells, so I can address them, right? Can you give us the top five signs that somebody is nervous based on their body language? Yes. So uh, touching the hands, uh, touching the face, touching the stomach, that actually comes out of Cornell University. They actually found that when we're nervous, we touch our um, stomach or we clench our stomach or we touch our face. Um, third is uh, purposeless gestures. So wringing the hands, cracking the knuckles, touching the back of the neck, gestures that have no purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, What's another one? I'm trying to take the research. Playing with the necklace? Playing with your necklace, fidgeting. Those are also also purposeless gestures. Uh, Adding unnecessary pauses or awkward pauses. So someone's in the middle of a talk and they're they're really trying to explain it, but they're... they're pausing as mid <laughs> mid word or mid mid sentence like that. Uh, if you call out time? somebody on a Zoom meeting, so for their it, nervous tell, do they get more nervous? It depends on how you do it, right? Intention is everything here. So I don't like being like that. Gotcha. Yeah, that that's not a good way to interact with cues. 
However, if I notice, like I'm on a team call and I say, hey, everyone, we're having a big New Year's launch. And I notice one of my team members shows a cluster of three nervous tells. One, one cue by itself does not usually mean anything, right? Like, for example, we're going to talk about lying in the last, the last question. One of the top lying red flags is touching the nose. So liars have, um, we have a very specific kind of tissue in our nose and research has found that when we lie and we're in guilt, it uh, swells and it causes our nose to itch. So Bill Clinton, during his Monica Lewinsky testimony, when he lied, he touched his nose 26 times. In his truthful testimony, he touched his nose twice. So this is a, a response that we have. So um, are you lying but, right now? Because you just touched your nose. No, I'm showing you. I'm showing you. <laughs> oh, because I'm sorry. I, I, but also, what if you have allergies? What if you have a cold? So one cue by itself is never good. Three cues. So if I see someone nose touch, and let's another um, uh, like interesting lying tell is a shame touch. So when we touch the side of our forehead, we often do this when we're very embarrassed. It's an eye blocking behavior. And I see a lip purse. So we press our lips into a hard line. That's three very, very big red flags in a row. That's when I either will pause the Zoom call and I'll be like, hey, everyone, I just want to check in. Rob, does this sound doable to you? This launch timeline? Are we good on this? Anything that I should know or we should, that we're not thinking about? That's me, not me saying, Rob, I saw you touch your nose, <laughs> which is like terrible. But it's me checking in with him. Or I might afterwards hang up the Zoom call, text him or call him or email and say, hey, are you good with the launch? I just want to make sure. So Got I it. believe in that. Got it. Okay. That's super okay, so, cool. So how do I tell what so, my lying tell is? Okay. So the last question. So we did what you had for breakfast, your most embarrassing story. The last one is the most important. I want you to make up an embarrassing story that did not happen to you and tell it to the camera and try to convince me it happened to you. This is an example of what you do when you're trying to make up a completely false story and you will see exactly what you do when you lie. Wow. That's so cool. It's fun. So it's really I wanna, fun. I want to do some rapid fire questions. Okay. Let's okay. do it. Um, so what are your top tips for displaying charisma and being more influential on a Zoom call? Okay, so on a Zoom call specifically, there's a couple of nonverbal cues that translate really well over camera. So one of them you do a lot, which is a lean. So a lean is a universal charisma cue. The reason for this is because when we're trying to understand something better, when we activate our five senses, we lean in. We hear something better, we lean in. We wanna see something better, we lean in. We wanna smell something, we lean in. So a lean cue is what you can do on a Zoom call when someone says something super interesting or powerful. We do this in person, but on Zoom, we forget that we had that kind of interpersonal interaction. So if you were to say something, Mel, that was super impactful, I would go, really? Wow, that's so interesting. Not even a lot, just a couple of in inches. And I want to do a little experiment here so you can actually feel this. Wherever you are right now, if you're sitting or standing or running or cooking, I want you to lean forward just two inches. Go ahead and try it with me. What research has found is that when you lean forward two inches, it actually activates a pre-action part of your brain. It literally makes you more motivated. And so what can happen is when you lean in, it makes you a better listener. It also is contagious. It tells the other person, wow, they like what I'm saying so much. They're literally trying to lean in to activate what I'm saying. So you want to use the lean very purposefully when you hear something good or when you're saying something that you want someone to pay attention to. So if I, for example, even on this interview, when I'm saying something that I really strongly believe in, I will bold it by adding a lean. So I'll say, this is one of the most important things I could share today. That is a cue for you. Bold, bold, listen to this. So leans for you listening and as a speaker. I love that. Easy. Is there any phrase or something that you suggest, particularly somebody who's shy or introverted to say or do during a virtual meeting to be more influential? Ah, okay. We didn't even talk about verb verbs. We didn't even talk about words. So words are an incredibly important aspect of our charisma that we also need to address, right? So for, for verbal power, what you want to do, especially for my introverts, and especially on a video call is use warmth verbal cues. 
we actually did a study uh, with Dr. Paul Zak. Dr. Paul Zak is a big oxytocin researcher. He's incredible. He's one of my good friends where I wanted to know during the pandemic, if saying warm words could stimulate connection. So in other words, I'm on a video call. If we were in person, Mel, you and I would be hugging, we'd you know high five, we'd, we'd have some sort of touch. I wanted to know, could you replace that verbally? What we found was we had people wear, he created a software that people wear that measures their skin conductance, their physiology. When I say, I'm sending a virtual high five, I wish I could give you a digital hug. I'm uh, giving you a warm wave from here. When I say those words, it actually triggers a physiological response on your skin. So one thing that you can do in the very start of a call or at the very end of a call is, oh, I wish I could give you a hug. A virtual one will have to do. Oh, or you know, this has been so lovely talking to you. I just feel so much warmth and I just had such a great time connecting with you. Using warm words, connection, warmth, trust, hug, handshake, they actually trigger a physiological response to the other person. So if you can use those warm words, it is a very easy way to trigger more warmth. That's fantastic. Easy. Okay. Terrific. What about emails? How do you <sighs> display more influence, more charisma in an email? What is the pros? What's the danger zone? Okay. So remember the good news is, by the way, I just want to say a, a big rule here. I'm sharing a lot of cues. Some of these cues you're going to hear and you're going to be like, oh, that one is so good. Great. Some of the cues I'm going to say, and you're going to be like, I don't know about that. That's good. I actually want you to follow your instinct. There are 96 cues in the book. It's like a recipe. There are some ingredients you're not going to like, and I don't want you to do cues that you don't like. For example, um, one of the cues I teach is a steeple, right? So it's a, it's when you just touch your fingers together and you make sort of like a church steeple. If you watch Shark Tank, Kevin O'Leary loves this gesture. Yes. Some people love it. Some people hate it. If you love it, great. If you don't, discard it. So when I'm about to share cue wise, I want you to make sure that you actually like it before you use it. Like you're able to use different ingredients. Like that's right. actually a good thing. I totally forgot what the question was. We you repeat it? No me? problem. Actually, let me ask you this one. What yeah. are the danger zone cues on a virtual meeting? What should okay. you never do? Okay. So great. Okay. So danger zone cues in a virtual meeting. One, I always, 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 always want you to front with the camera. So research is very, very clear what, on What this. does that mean front with the Fronting. camera? Okay. So when we are aligned on parallel lines with someone, our brain likes it. So fronting is when I angle my toes, my torso, and my top towards the camera. Research has found that if I were to give the entire interview with one shoulder angled back and my toes angled out, it would actually make it hard for you to believe me. It would make it really hard for you to open up to me. And so a mistake that I often see on Zoom calls is people will either angle out or the worst of the worst, they have their camera on their side and they're typing like this. Oh, so I, yes. And, I hate that. I hate, I'm oh. like, just turn the damn camera off. Yes. I would rather. So one thing I want you to make sure of is your setup. Not only are you a foot and a half away, but you are on parallel lines with the other person. So you're angling your toes, your torso, and your head towards them. This is both on Zoom and in person. Even in person, when someone is kind of angled out and they're trying to talk to you, you can literally feel the disengagement. The reason for this is because our toes are sort of secret windows into the soul, as I like to call them. Your toes, the way that they're pointed, usually indicate a secret direction that you want to go. So I have noticed anecdotally that when someone is ready to leave a conversation, you know, you're at a networking event or at a holiday party, and they have to go to the bathroom or they're kind of done, they will angle their toes towards the exit. Wow. And kind of, their body is like, we got to go. We want to go. So if I'm angled away from you with my toes angled towards the exit, you're subconsciously picking up on the fact that part of me is left the conversation. You know what I'm realizing? That's stage one of me trying to get my husband, Chris, to leave a party. Yeah. I go up and walk up to him, but I'm angled toward the door, like, let's go. And I do that physically without realizing it before I put my hand on my back and they're like, let's go. Yep. So, so interesting. Okay. So we know danger zone. You got to, you got to face the camera. You got to be pointed at the camera, toes at the camera. Yes. Otherwise you're signaling lack of interest and not that competent either. If you're not yeah, paying attention. Another danger zone cue is a facial cue that I want to, I just want to point out. So um, 
resting bothered face, right? <laughs> resting bothered face is when at rest, our face look bo looks bothered. Um, I have resting bothered face rather badly. Um, and that is important to understand about yourself because sometimes at rest, people will say, are you angry? Are you tired? You should know what your resting face looks like. So for example, if your resting face, my resting face looks like sadness. Mm. So sadness is a universal micro expression. So sadness is when our, the corners of our mouth turn down into an yeah. upside down U and when our eyelids droop and sometimes even our, our eyebrows pinch together. When I'm at rest, I tend to look a little sad because that's how my mouth points. This is important for me to know because if you look sad at rest, people are going to assume you're disappointed. You're low energy. How about anger? What if you have anger? So anger is a different look. I don't have this, but I know people who do. So people I do. Who have, I, yeah, who have anger at rest, they pinch their eyebrows so that these two vertical lines appear in between yep. their eyebrows. So they might be concentrating, but they look a little irritated, a little frustrated, a little angry. None of these are right or wrong, but it's important to know how people might be perceiving you when you're just listening. So since I know that I look sad, I work hard, especially when I'm listening to someone and trying to encourage them to dial up warmth. If you know that you look angry at rest, it's really important for you to dial up, making someone feel reassured, making someone feel like they're not frustrating you, that you're really happy with them. That way, verbally, you're overcoming that resting face. Yeah. So like the three head nod, the mm, mm hmm Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, mm -hmm. I just got rid of the bitch face and now I'm signaling exactly. more. I'm, I'm taking the, the cues here. This is great. All right. Now, what are strategies for dialing up charisma and influence, warmth and competency in emails? Okay. Emails. Yes. So- I love in an email, the most important thing you have to do in an email is break social scripts. So what happened in email, we're so overflow, over, overloaded with email. So I love running tests on our email newsletter. So we have an email newsletter and I can actually see what's getting open rates, what's getting click rates. And one thing that we found is anytime we are, we trigger someone's autopilot is when we use a subject like follow-up or information <laughs> or update or next week's meeting. Don't you wait. are literally <laughs> telling the other person to go to sleep. Go to sleep. <laughs> so are you saying we can have fun in work emails? Yes. Now fun, what I mean is use charisma verbal cues. So there is, this is art, not science. Certain words trigger an emotional response. For like example, what? one. Okay. So one study, this is a really interesting study. What they did is they wanted to know if achievement-oriented words could make people achieve more. So achievement-oriented words are words like win, success, master, achieve, comp compete, race. Even me just saying the word win could actually change the way your brain thinks. So here's what they did, very simple experiment. They brought people into their lab. They split them up into two different groups. The first group got an intelligence test with a very simple set of directions. These directions were completely autopilot, socially scripted, sterile. Please take the following test to the best of your ability. You have 10 minutes to complete it. Please use a pencil. Okay. Very, very basic directions you've read a million times before. The second set of directions was the same word count. So not longer, not shorter, but they sprinkled in, they swapped in a couple of achievement oriented words. So uh, please perform well on this achievement test. The more answers you can win correctly, the better. Uh, please succeed with a pencil, right? So they just sprinkled in yeah. a couple of achievement-oriented words. They found that just three or four achievement-oriented words not only made them perform better on the intelligence test, it doubled, doubled the participant's desire to keep working on the test. Wow. That's pretty cool. It's so cool because it means in your emails, you can gift behavior change. Okay, so for charisma, which impacts influence and income and uh, interest or in whatever the heck they are, uh, impact. Impact. Um, so for email, what words do we want to use? Are we throwing in emojis and gifts? Like, how does this work? Obviously okay. not all caps and tons of explanation points, but- No, no. Okay, so what I like in an email is to have, and I have samples of this in the book if you want to like read a template, is- 
I want you to have warm words, a couple of warm words, warm words, trigger the warm and fuzzies. So, so happy to connect with you last week. I'm so looking forward to collaborating in our meeting next week. When people read words like collaborate, they are literally more likely to be collaborative. Okay. So you are actually gifting behavior. What I want you to think about when you're writing an email, this is a really weird way to write an email, but it works. How do I want someone to think, feel, and behave after reading this email? If you want them to be warm and collaborative and open and happy and trustworthy, use those words. You are literally gifting them that feeling. But if you want them to get it done, be productive and efficient, let's brainstorm, let's power through, onward, let's do it. I want you to gift more competent words. So the perfect email yes. has a balance of let's connect, let's collaborate. I can't wait for the meeting next week. And let's blast through this agenda. I can't wait to hit our goals. We're going to do everything together onwards, Vanessa. You know what I hear is I hear enthusiasm. I hear confidence in those words. You're displaying that, which then signals to me that I'm on a team that wants to do that. You want to know one word I don't like in an email? Oh, tell me. I hate that trend that started a couple years ago where people would generically sign everything best. Ugh. Best best to me as a sign off is like passive aggressive, not interested, phony pretending I give a shit. That's what best means to me. And it's socially scripted, right? Like yes, it doesn't even mean best. It doesn't even mean anything. A little experiment that we did in our newsletters is I was trying different sign offs and I wanted to know if I could change like people's perception of me based on the sign off. And so now I use after a series of tests, always every sign off in my email is to your success, Vanessa. Oh, thank you, it, Vanessa. Like, it's like a gift. It's like success. Yes. Gifted. <laughs> I love that. And you know what I just noticed? Hmm. I spoke at the end of my breath. So I was like, oh, thank you, Vanessa. Like I went up on that. And I don't know if that means that I was not being, uh, no, a piece, I actually it, it, mean it. So now I'm going to breathe. It. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> but it, but actually that was authentic because you were, a, it was, it was a compliment. It was appeasement. Yes. So you were in, encouraging liking. So you went really high because you loved it. Well, I we did. Do, well, we're around babies and puppies. We go yes. really high like this because we really, really want them to feel good. That's good. Oh, oh that's so nice. Yes. But. But remember, all of our all of our uh, people pleasers out there, speaking like that around puppies and babies, and when you truly mean it because you want to compliment something, someone, that's great. Speaking like that all the time because you are seeking reassurance or seeking being liked, that's killing your ability to be respected, and it's also not authentic. And this works with toddlers, right? I have a toddler, four and a half. She's not even a toddler anymore. If I'm serious with my toddler, I go real low, right? I'm real low. I'm like, Sienna, uh-uh, we are not doing that. And she hears it. So you also can use, when you, you're talking to your baby or your puppy or your toddler, and you're like, good job, wonderful job. Don't touch that, right? There's a big difference. They hear that too. Little oh, ones do they hear. ever. Oh, do they ever. Like when yeah. Chris lowers his tone of voice, Everything in this house stops when the three kids are here. So another quick question. What are the body language cues that somebody that you're dating is into you? Ooh, how fun. Okay, so when we really like something, we want to get as close as possible. We also are trying to produce as much oxytocin. We have not talked about haptics, which is a fancy word for touch. So this is a little bit different culture to culture, but universally, when we physically touch in any way, so that can be an arm touch, a hug, a cheek kiss, a back pat, we produce oxytocin, that chemical connection. So when we really like someone, we are really wanting to produce that oxytocin. So if someone's very into you, they will look for any and every opportunity to touch, right? Hmm. So extra long hug, two cheek kiss. They reach across the table. They touch your hand. They touch your back when you're walking by. They touch your shoulder. And when they laugh, they touch the side of your arm. Those are all conscious and subconscious ways of saying, I want more chemical. I want more oxytocin because oxytocin is what gets us to kiss. It's what makes us feel really attractive. The more oxytocin that's flowing through our bodies, the more we feel like, wow, this person and I, we are just getting each other. 
So looking for lots of opportunities to touch. This is also a way that you can signal that you're very into someone, right? Is taking small opportunities to touch. A note here is as you move up the arm, the touch becomes more intimate. So the least intimate part of the body is the hand, right? We handshake. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. because we can handshake someone really far away from our torso and our most vulnerable yep. parts of our body, right? Yep. So that's the least intimate. If you are not that into someone or you're not sure, you'll, you'll notice the hand touching. So not only handshake, but someone might touch your hand or touch the back of your hand. That's the least intimate. The farther up the arm you go into the torso, into the back, the more intimate the touch is. Wow. So I always say, start slow. Right. That's right. And you know what happens when you reach the armpit? It's ticklish. <laughs> and very intimate. And very, very intimate. intimate. That's right. And it activates those pheromones too. <laughs> um, let's talk disrespect. Oh, yes. How does somebody that is charismatic handle disrespect with warmth and competence? Oh, so first of all, you want to activate reciprocity. Remember that the more charismatic we are, the more contagious we are. So the very, very first step is what we've been talking about this entire time, which is you want to signal warmth and competence and hope they catch up. That's the very first thing, right? If you are feeling cold, disrespect, dismissal, um, one of the things that drives me crazy is like dismissive body language, someone who yes. kind of isn't actually engaging with me. So the very first thing I try is I gift them a lot of warmth and competence. And this is really important. Our instinct when someone is snubbing us or disrespecting us is to pull away. Our instinct is to go on offensive or defensive. That is actually what I don't want you to do. The moment that someone disrespects you, if you go on offensive, which is it's your fault, how dare you? I don't like you. You are immediately going to trigger more disrespect. Right. And I also don't want you to go on defensive. It's not me. It's not my problem. I, I don't, you know, it's not all about, it's all about you, not me. That also makes you someone disengage. So instead, I want you to fight your instinct and gift, gift warmth, gift competence, hope that rubs off on them. Second, if it doesn't work, if you're, if you're gifting and it's not happening to you, I believe in direct, radical transparency and direct honesty, saying exactly what you need. And sometimes that's, hey, I, I don't know if you're feeling this. I don't know if you're into this. You seem really frustrated, but here's what I need today. I will often call out and use mm. words like upset frustrated, confused, hard, difficult to talk to. Sometimes calling out the emotion allows the person to correct you. So in times I've said, you know, I can see you're a little bit upset or I can see you're a little bit frustrated. And they'll say, no, I'm not frustrated. I'm disappointed. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So if you offer a word that you think they're feeling, they'll either say, yes, I am frustrated. I don't know why X, Y, Z deadline wasn't met or they correct you with the right emotion, that gives you so much information. So hopefully you can move past this respect and actually have a productive conversation as opposed to this back and forth that's not working. Amazing. One final question. Ooh. And this is a gift to my shy introverts out there. Okay. Can okay. you give us five surprising, silent, charismatic cues? that will help someone command respect? Yes. So the most important one for introverts, silent, is mirroring. So mirroring is a highly charismatic cue because when we really like someone, when we're on the same page with them, what research has found is that we ab sub subconsciously mirror their nonverbal. So if you're with someone and you don't want to speak, you don't want to share a lot, verbal is maybe less of your favorite mode of communication, one gift you can give them to be highly charismatic yourself is to mirror them very subtly. So if they're leaning in, you're leaning in. If they're um, nodding their head a lot, you nod your head a lot. If they're using less gestures, maybe you use less gestures. This is a way that highly charismatic people will dial up or dial down. Oprah does this exceptionally well. Watch her interviews with high energy people. Her high energy interviews, she dials up her energy. She literally uses more hand gestures, more movement, more leans, more nods. She's more expressive with her face. In her low energy interviews, she doesn't try to convince them or change them. She matches, she dials down, she becomes less expressive. Yeah. She uses more calm hand gestures. So mirroring is one. Okay. The second one is an eyebrow raise. So an eyebrow raise is a universal gesture of, I'm listening. I'm open. Tell me more. 
the, the kind of funny one is romantically, if I were to, you know, Mel signal to you across the bar and go, you know, with my eyebrows, it's a signal of interest, right? That's a, a lubricant, all right. Yeah, <laughs> right. So that's a signal of interest. So introverts can do this instead of speaking. So if you're in a boardroom or in a Zoom meeting or on a date and you want to encourage someone by saying, I'm listening, tell me more, you can literally raise your eyebrows up. You can also do this while you're speaking. So um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uses this cue a lot. So he, I found this great uh, quote with him where he said, he writes books based on eyebrow raising things he says. So one little test he does is he goes on airplanes. <laughs> By the way, I would love to sit next to Neil deGrasse Tyson on an airplane. He goes on airplanes and he starts talking to the person next to him and he shares a bunch of facts about space. Uh, he's an astrophysicist, space and science. And he says, every time the other person goes, really? And raises their eyebrows up, he writes it down. And he says, he only puts things in his book that people raise their eyebrows at because it's That's such cool. a specific cue of curiosity. So you can raise your eyebrows. You can also look for eyebrow raises. Okay. So that's number two. Number Mary. three, I noticed when you raise your eyebrows, you also cocked your head. Is that another way to demonstrate so and command respect? Am I allowed to do three and four, which is the head tilt and nodding? Because those yeah, are of course. So, so, they're so they're good. So warming. So nodding and head tilting. And then I want to do a different one. I'm going to say specifically mirroring empathy. And what I mean by this is introverts have a superpower. They are so good at observing. They are so good at spotting emotions that other people miss and spotting emotional needs. That is your superpower. So that's what you should use. So if you see someone in authentic happiness, you should be mirroring that happiness back to them and capitalizing on that happiness. That could be mirroring the smile back to them. That could be dialing up your gestures, but it also could be negative. So if you see someone who's in sadness, you can mirror that sadness by showing that empathy. So if someone's really sad and they pinch their eyebrows together and they droop the corners of their, um, their lips down, and you can see that they're really struggling, you can do that with them and say, I hear you, or you don't have to say anything. If you have a friend who's sharing something that makes them sad and you show sadness, you are literally saying, I care about you so much that I want to take on the emotional burden with you. And mm. I think that is beautiful. Oh, you know what else is beautiful? Mm. All the wisdom and knowledge <laughs> you just dropped today like a freaking bomb on <laughs> all of the things that we have been doing that we didn't realize that were lowering our influence, our impact, and the income that we're making. And yeah. so I want to take a minute on behalf of absolutely everybody listening to thank you. Oh. Because this was, so tact this was so tactical. This was so smart and informative. And the other reason why I loved this conversation so much is because everything that you shared, we can put to use immediately. Yes. And it tracks back to this research that 82% of how somebody sizes you up, mm -hmm. whether or not you influence them, what they think of you has to do with your charisma and how you're displaying warmth and competency. And you gave us the gift of teaching us how to do it with specific tools. I cannot thank you enough, Vanessa. We have got to have you back. I'm sure we're going to have a gajillion <laughs> questions about specific situations. Love and it. so just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was three, maybe four, five head nods in a row because I mean it. And I'm going lower on my voice to command the fact that you're a freaking superstar, Vanessa. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for listening. And I also want to thank you for the space to talk about this and empower people that remember you tell the world how it should treat you. So the more purposeful you are with your cues, the better people will treat you and you deserve that. So thank you so much for having me. Oh my God. Thank you. You're the best. Wasn't that awesome? I mean, Vanessa's awesome. And you know what else is awesome? You. You are awesome. You have the it factor and now you know how to hack charisma and how to use body language to get what you want. And before we take off here, I want to tell you something else. I love you. I really do. And I believe in you. 
and I believe in your ability and that it factor inside of you and the charisma you are going to bring to the surface and display everywhere you go. I believe that you're going to use that to create a better life. And that's why I'm here to remind you of that twice a week, every week with this podcast. Oh my God, I just love you. Alrighty, you have an awesome day now and I'll talk to you in a few days. It's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.